Welcome to the exam room live by the Physicians Committee, the healthiest half hour ish anywhere on the internet today. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and we appreciate you being here with us here on Facebook and on YouTube. Big show on tap for you today. Dr. Neil Barnard is here. Dr. Jasmal Sardana is here, and we've got a ton of headlines to conquer, like more fresh fruits and vegetables and less prepackaged meals. Indeed, the times they are a changing at the grocery store. And 133 billion pounds of food goes in the garbage can every year in America. Well, we're going to tell you what a group of researchers is doing to cut down on that enormous waste. That and more in five things you need to know. Plus, as I said, Dr. Neil Barnard is back fresh from a protest outside of Smithfield Food headquarters yesterday. Dr. Barnard, we're going to get a full recap from you. And I understand that you're going to be looking at new research putting COVID-19 and the seasonal flu head to head. Exactly. You bet. Looking forward to catching up with you about that and sleep. Man, it happens, but maybe not as much as it should. And if you are sleep deprived, your diet may leave a lot to be desired. So to talk to us about that is Dr. Jasmine Sardana. Looking forward to catching up with you today, Dr. Jazz. Thanks, Jack. All right. And we're also going to be examining along those same lines, whether it's possible to actually catch up on sleep with those binge hibernations on the weekend. It is Friday after all, right? And we're going to be answering your questions when we open up the doctor's mailbag. So if you have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post it in the comments right now. We'll be reaching in randomly and picking one up, answering it before the end of the show. So go ahead and post yours right now. But let's start today, kick everything off with a check on headlines and five things that you need to know for this Friday, May 15th. 2020. A check of the global coronavirus tracker reveals there are now more than 4,444,000 cases since the pandemic began, with the death toll now having surpassed 300,000. In the U.S., Thursday saw the highest number of new cases reported in over a week, with deaths, deaths also trending upward in each of the past three days. Nearly 86,000 Americans have died since the outbreak began. Researchers in Africa are warning that the coronavirus could infect up to a quarter billion residents there and claim 200,000 lives. The projection hints that the virus may be spreading more slowly there and in a trade-off of sorts with fewer cases and deaths overall than other parts of the world, it may also mean that the virus there will remain a threat for years after the pandemic has been averted elsewhere. Changing gears now, a Belgian study finds that shoppers are buying more fresh fruits and vegetables while leaving frozen and ready-made meals out of their cart during the pandemic. The survey finds, uh, the survey, I should say, of more than 11,000 shoppers in 11 countries finds sales of microwavable dinners were down. Researchers at the University of Antwerpen say the shift comes as people are becoming more comfortable with cooking at home and have taken a keener interest in their health during this time of uncertainty. And researchers at the University of Maryland are setting out to tackle the enormous problem of food waste. Americans are wasting about 133 billion pounds of food every year, and that's roughly a third of the entire consumer supply. Much of that can be chalked up to confusion over food labels, say the researchers. Consumers see up to 50 different phrases on packages, sell by, best by, best if used by, used by. It's all too much. It's also confusing, and it's also at the discretion of food manufacturers. Some foods remain perfectly edible long after those dates have come and gone. So this Maryland group is developed Developing universal guidance they hope will be adopted to clear up confusion and reduce waste significantly. And finally, the documentary The Game Changers is now streaming in China. The film star James Wilk says it's been very well received so far, adding that the plant-based flick hasn't faced nearly as much criticism there as it has in the West. Wilkes chalks that up to the traditional diet there being more plant-based. Three years ago, the Chinese government began implementing a plan that would reduce meat consumption by up to 50%. Time now to welcome Dr. Barnard back to the show. And Dr. Barnard, as we said at the top, you are fresh off of the produce, uh, protest yesterday down at Smithfield Food. Yourself and a group of other doctors got together out there, protested right outside of the headquarters. How did everything go? 
Well, it, it was such an important uh, event, um, as I guess everybody has heard uh, that the slaughterhouse workers have been dying at, at, at surprising rates. More than 15,000 meat uh, processing plant workers have contracted COVID-19 already, and more than 60 have died. And that toll is going up and up and up. And so the plants were closed, and then there were, there's been this move to reopen them again. And our concerns are, number one, for the workers going back in there, they're going to be infected. Number two, uh, the virus is almost certain to be brought in by asymptomatic people who will cough and breathe it out into the air. It settles on the meat. If you wrap the meat up and you send it out, um, it thrives at refrigeration temperatures. And if meat is frozen, the virus is viable virtually indefinitely. In other words, it goes out from the slaughterhouse, goes into your kitchen, gets on your counter, contaminates everything. It's the last thing anybody needs. Uh, so we made a strong appeal at Smithfield's world headquarters to close the plants down. And um, the, the press has been, I have to say, very sympathetic. And we had quite a number of Smithfield employees driving in and driving out. And uh, we got the thumbs up from just about everybody. That's outstanding. And and you mentioned the press. I know that a lot of media did make it out there yesterday. As a matter of fact, I had some family down in the Norfolk, Virginia area contact me. They say, hey, I think I saw Dr. Barnard from your show. Wasn't he on the news last night? And sure enough, you guys were making the rounds. That's fantastic. Yes. But, we, you know, we have a long ways to go because this has been portrayed as sort of a, a meat shortage. Um, what are we going to do if, if uh, we don't have food on the table? I think it's time for people to, to think of meat as something other than food. Um, if you have, uh, if you can't get cocaine or heroin, you don't make, you don't talk about it being a terrible shortage. You, you realize that people are going to be healthier. Um, if you don't eat meat, you're going to be healthier. So, um, these products have long been by these products, I mean, bacon and sausage have long been associated with colorectal cancer, with diabetes, with other health issues. Now they're associated with COVID-19 uh, enough is clearly enough. And we've seen market trends here time and time and time again over the past month, all pointing toward people adopting a more plant-based diet, whether it be through, you know, prepackaged foods like, you know, Impossible Burgers and things of that nature. But then we just heard that people are also buying more fresh fruits and vegetables and leaving other processed foods out of the shopping cart. So all of that trends in the healthier direction, which is definitely good news. And you all did a phenomenal job raising awareness for that yesterday. Well, Dr. Lot, Barn we got a lot, we got a lot more to come. Um, watch the headlines. You're going to see more of the same uh, uh, as soon as this coming week. Ooh, and that, my friends, is what we call a tease in the news business. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Barnard, what else do you have in store for us today? I understand that there's been a study put out that compares uh, COVID-19 and the flu head to head. Uh, yeah, exactly. Can you see, can you see the screen here? Not just, uh, now we can. Yes, sir. Do you see where it says COVID-19? Does it equal the flu? Mm, we do indeed. That's the question that people have been raising. Um, and, and in fact, this goes really to the earliest days of the pandemic. People were saying, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just like a flu. Um, and, and, and there's, there's a kernel of truth to that, that for most people who get the flu and most people who get COVID-19, they pull through it. They may even be asymptomatic. They don't even know they had it. Um, and in both cases, it's older folks or people with underlying health conditions who do very badly. Uh, but that's and they're both caused by viruses. Um, and in fact, influenza was a devastating disease when it first broke in in 1918, killed 50 million people, far more than COVID-19. Um, but some people have tried to suggest that we don't need to take COVID-19 very seriously because it's just like the flu. Well, yesterday, JAMA Internal Medicine uh, put out a, a really important article that I wanted to just share with you. Um, and first of all, let's do a comparison. What they said, the reason people are talking about COVID-19 being like the flu, if you look at annual cases of influenza, they're estimated between 24,000 and about 62,000. So with COVID-19, we're up to about, um, I'm sorry, this is deaths. Uh, COVID-19 deaths about 87,000. So, so you could make a case that they're in a similar ballpark. However, here's a however, the figures on the left for influenza those are the estimated cases. That's sort of a calculation. But the 87,000 COVID-19 deaths, those are real deaths that people counted them up and they know for sure. So why does that matter? If you look at influenza and COVID-19 and you look at how many actual documented deaths are there, in the worst flu season week, you get if you go all the way back to about seven or eight years, and you just calculate how many people died during the worst flu weeks, you get uh, 752 deaths. 
take the worst weeks uh, now that we're having with COVID-19, it's about 15,000 deaths. So in other words, these are not estimated deaths. This is not a mathematical model. These are real bodies that are counted up. So uh, influenza can be bad, influenza can be deadly, and it really was when there had been no herd immunity at all back in 1918. Um, COVID-19 is now emerging without uh, pre-existing immunity, and it is a killer. Again, most people will do well, many people will not. Got to take it totally seriously. Uh, and there's one other thing, uh, Chuck, I, I wanted to, to bring in. There's been a new syn uh, syndrome in children that has just been emerging over the last about three weeks. Uh, it's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. Uh, April 26th was the, really the first clues that we were having about it. And this was uh, a handful of cases in the United Kingdom. And then earlier this month, it arrived in the United States and it's been uh, most notably in New York, but now we've started to see it in other places as well. And what is this? Um, it's, first of all, it's in kids. So you're less than 21, but it presents with fever. Uh, a fairly high fever over 100 uh, Fahrenheit or over 30, uh, 38 centigrade, along with inflammation. When I say inflammation, what I mean is that the body's immune system is reacting to something. Uh, and you see inflammatory markers that are up, either C-reactive protein or, uh, or an ESR. And, and there are a number of other tests that the doctor can draw, but the doctor will say, wow, you've got a lot of inflammation going on. Uh, multi-organ disease. In other words, your heart can be involved, your lungs, your kidneys, your GI tract, skin, neurological as well. And this always occurs in somebody who's been exposed to COVID-19 already, or, or uh, either they had a positive test or they had known exposure. Now, the reason that people were sort of, uh, I don't want to say prepared for this, but, but it looked a bit familiar, is there is a disease not very common, but it, but it does occur, particularly in young children called Kawasaki disease. Um, and you're gonna hear more about this as time goes on. It seems to be increasing. And it's an inflammatory disease of the blood vessels. You see it in young kids. Uh, the cause is not known at all, but let me describe what the heck this is. Uh, it starts with fever, just like the disease that I was describing related to COVID-19. The fever can be very, very high. Um, and you look at the child's eyes and they often are bloodshot, and they'll have a peculiar rash and uh, their lips are red and dry. And when they open their mouth, the tongue has sort of a white, they call it a strawberry tongue. It's a white coating and these red bumps on it, sore throat. Uh, they can have swollen palms or soles and also some lymph nodes that you can feel. Uh, that's the bad news is it's a frightening disease, but in most, in, in nearly every case, Kawasaki disease uh, remits. It's uh, relatively straightforward treatment. Now, with regard to the COVID-19 in kids, there have been some fatalities. Most of the kids have pulled through, um, uh, but there have been some fatalities. So we're watching every day to see what, what is going on with this. So bottom line, back where we started, um, COVID-19, for most people, they do well. That's certainly true for kids. Kids do really great um, in most cases. However, there are plenty of exceptions to that, particularly for older folks, people with underlying health conditions, and now even children, we're seeing some uh, cases that are, are really quite uh, concerning. So back to you, Chuck. It still it fascinates me how this virus, this disease just manifests itself in so many different ways. It, we still haven't figured out really the totality of the damage that it can do. I mean, just in, in your experience, have you heard of a virus like this that can cause so many different issues? Um, uh, yeah, well, I think there are two things. One is it's a new, it's a new virus. Um, and viruses don't just exist and remain static. Their genetic blueprint will change and will modify as time goes on. Um, and so when you get a new, new virus uh, entering the human species, as we have now with, with COVID-19, um, the manifestations are starting to, to become clearer. The pediatric manifestations are now becoming clearer. But the real issue is that it's going to mutate further. And it's, it's not going to go away. It's going to mutate further. And that means some mutations could be more benign, like a mild influenza. Um, some could be worse than the one we have now. My best guess is that both of those scenarios are going to happen, that you'll see some variants that are benign and some variants that are uh, m more uh, frequently fatal than the current one. And I don't think it's going to go away. I think we're going to see this uh, recurring. It would be nice if it goes away. I don't think it's going to happen. 
All right. Well, I'm still going to keep my fingers crossed for that. Dr. Well, Barnard. You know, you know what it means is, is Chuck, you and I've talked about this on just about every show is, is it means we've got to do everything we can to avoid getting it. And that's the hand washing and so forth, but we've got to deal with those underlying health conditions. And um, just uh, last week, JAMA published a very nice viewpoint article um, talking about uh, racial inequities with regard to mortality, which we've also talked about. Um, and they made the point that we've got to deal with the underlying health conditions. We've got to deal with hypertension and diabetes, and it doesn't take long. Change your diet, get your medications together in two, three weeks, you can be in a better condition than you are now. If the virus isn't going away, the thing we can change is us. We're going to be speaking about those racial inequities and those underlying conditions next week, actually. The ageless vegan Tracy McWhorter from right here in Washington, D.C., she's going to be joining us right here on the exam room live. So stick around for that. That is going to be an exciting episode. But uh, Dr. Barnard, I also want you to stick around because coming up in just a little bit, we're going to open up the doctor's mailbag, reach in, pull out a question. So if you have one for Dr. Barnard right now, go ahead and post it in the comment section. We'll try to get you an answer by the end of the show. Moving on right now. Well, here's a question for you. How much sleep did you get last night? If you're like the majority of us, the answer is not enough. More than half of us are sleeping less than seven hours a night, and that can lead to a whole host of problems, including obesity. And as we've talked about time and again on this show, obesity is linked to those underlying conditions that increase the risk for COVID-19. But then how does your diet factor in? Well, we're going to find out because sleep and diet is truly a two-way street. So with the X's and O's of Z's, I want to welcome Dr. Jasmil Sardana back to the exam room live. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Jazz. Thank you so much for having me, Chuck. Happy to be here and happy to talk about sleep. We just mentioned that a lack of sleep can be tied to a whole bunch of different problems, but what exactly is happening when we do sleep that can help prevent those problems from occurring? So sleep, we know this, um, you know, certainly we've studied it and we know that sleep is so vital. It's so important. Um, it is vital in repair in our cells. It's vital for growth. It's vital for cognitive function. Um, it's vital for our moods. We know that when we don't get enough sleep, we're slightly irritable, not me, um, maybe some of you guys. No, I'm totally <laughs> irritable if I don't get my sleep. Um, and it's really key and plays such an important part in making sure that our immune system stays as healthy as possible. So there was a landmark study uh, out of the um, University of Chicago, and they had individuals um, purposely sleep only four hours a night. And they only did this for about, not only, but six consecutive days. That's quite a bit. Um, so four hours, six consecutive days. And what they found um, is that they measured their blood pressures during this time, and they found that their blood pressures from baseline had elevated. Their cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone, was elevated. And also that half of the usual number of antibodies that are produced um, in response to the flu vaccine, they only had half of that, uh, the, or the number of antibodies that are produced to the flu vaccine, they only produced half the amount. So sleep is so vital, it's so important. Um, it's so important to kind of talk about, especially today, because so many of us, our daily routines have, have been disrupted and we're finding more and more, although we don't have all of the data yet, there, there is you know, data coming out that um, our sleep is being affected now more than ever. And so it's a good, important thing to be discussing. All right. Well, let's let's talk about this, you know, diet and sleep, food and sleep. I know sometimes I sleep better than others. And then I think back to, well, is it because of what I ate for dinner that night? So what is the connection between what it is that we're eating and how it is that we're sleeping? Great question. So it really depends on what you're eating, right? So let's take a look at a couple of different broad food categories. I usually don't like to, you know, minimize or separate out things, but this is how the information is available to us. So I think we'll talk about it this way. So we know that different food groups have been associated with sleep. And um, one of the big things that we talk about or have been discussed is carbs, carbohydrates, right? And so there was a, the Women's Health Initiative study, which is this large study that collected data over several years and, you know, tens of thousands of individuals are part of this study. And what they discovered um, out of that data, extracted out of that data, is that individuals who ate carbohydrates had less difficulty maintaining sleep. 
Um, but there was a caveat to that. The type of carbs actually mattered. So Chuck, if you're like me or others who may have had a sugary dessert uh, as a treat, you know, after your dinner one night, you probably felt a little bit sleepy. You got a little warm and fuzzy and, 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 and probably felt like, oh, all of this sugar is going to really help me sleep. But what we find is that with sugary desserts, things that are refined, which refined sugars that um, are high glycemic index foods, our blood sugar levels spike really abruptly and then come back down abruptly. And that affects sleep. So when that high blood sugar levels go up, we start feeling sleepy and we want to go back to sleep. But about four to five hours later, what we find is that abrupt kind of drop in our blood sugar levels. So when that happens, that triggers hunger it releases um, a stimulating neurotransmitter. It's called nor norepinephrine. And we usually see that neurotransmitter during the fight or flight response. But we see that that's elevated when our blood sugars drop abruptly after eating refined sugars uh, and simple carbs. So, so it's carbs are good, but the type of carbs matter. Complex carbs are um, better for sleep. Simple carbs, I would avoid. What about uh, fiber? I mean, fiber just seems to be the nutrient of choice here on the exam room. How does fiber and sleep match up? Uh, well, so that's the key between uh, the complex carbs and the simple carbs, right? So complex carbohydrates have fiber in them. And the fiber is what helps to keep our blood sugar levels even keel. And that's what plays the role in helping us sleep better. So fiber is really, really important. Fiber is amazing. <laughs> This next one is just kind of a fun word to say, isoflavone. <laughs> so when, when it comes to that, let's all say I that together, isoflavone. Iso, I love it so much. Isoflavone <laughs> and slumber. Talk to me. What's the connection there? So <laughs> it's up on the screen. That's great. <laughs> this is uh, the word of the day brought to you by the Physicians Committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so isoflavones are plant estrogen. And there is some evidence to show that isoflavones, higher daily intake of these products, have been positively associated with optimal sleep duration as well as quality. So sleep quantity as well as quality. Um, and so where do we find these, Chuck? Soy, tofu, tempeh, chickpeas, green peas, peanuts. So if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet and you're getting a, a wide variety or eating the rainbow, you're focusing on that you're going to get a good amount of uh, isoflavones. This next one is one that I learned about way back in my turkey eating days before I turned to a plant-based diet. You always hear during Thanksgiving about tryptophan, but tryptophan is not just in turkey. It's in a lot of plant-based foods and that can make you a little sleepy as well, huh? That's exactly right. You know, we hear so much about tryptophan in turkey and we make it, it almost feels like that's the only place we can get it. Um, and I also grew up that way, hearing about, you know, getting really sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner. But as you said, you're absolutely right. Tryptophan, it's an amino acid um, and it's um, found in plant-based proteins as well. And why tryptophan is so important is that because it's a building block, it's a precursor of sleep hormones or neurotransmitters, specifically melatonin. I'm sure a lot of our listeners, a lot of us have heard about uh, melatonin. Melatonin is a neurotransmitter that's released by the pineal gland of our brain. And it's really vital and important in regulating our sleep-wake cycles, as well as serotonin. Tonin. So tryptophan is key and important. Where can we find tryptophan? Similarly, in plant-based uh, foods like soy, pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds, mushrooms, broccoli, and peas. All right. How many people in your life do you know that think, uh, man, I just need to have that one glass of wine or that one drink right before I go to bed and that's going to help me sleep throughout the night? Is there something to that belief or are they kind of off base there? Right, we're all familiar with you know having a nightcap before we go to bed, um, but how does that truly affect our sleep? Initially, similar to um, you know you can think about alcohol like a simple sugar, essentially, and it has that same impact in that initially we may get warm and fuzzy and feel really sleepy, but what we know is that during that first half of our sleep cycle or the non-REM cycle, we kind of cycle through both of these phases of sleep, uh, that um, it may seem beneficial. But unfortunately, when we get into the deeper half of our sleep, the REM sleep, which is when that um, repair and all the important work happens within sleep, that actually 
alcohol disrupts that piece or that phase of sleep. So right, limiting now, alcohol definitely before uh, sleep. All right. Now I heart tea. I love hot tea. I'm good for two cups of black tea, two cups of green tea every single day, both of which have caffeine in there. So am I doing myself a disservice trying to get to sleep with all of that caffeine? The lay person in me says absolutely. But how much of a role does caffeine actually play in terms of how much sleep we're getting at night? Right. Um, you know, I think it does depend on the person, right? There can be some personal factors. If you're someone who's built up a tolerance to caffeine um, and you're getting, you know, two, three, four cups of coffee a day and it, maybe you had one, maybe that wouldn't affect you as much. But caffeine on its own is a stimulant. Um, so ideally avoiding a stimulant before going to bed, several hours uh, ideally before going to bed will allow your body to get into that deeper into those deeper stages of sleep without it being disrupted. All right, here's the big one. Those, you know, you, you mentioned ice cream at the top and what is ice cream loaded <laughs> with? Fat. So how does fat play in terms of the amount and the quality of sleep we're getting at night? So as you know, we, we're talking about these neurotransmitters that are really important in sleep. And it's so powerful to me as I was kind of gathering some of this data, just how much food disrupts or can um, support these neurotransmitters. Fat, we know, on one hand, actually disrupts those neurotransmitters. Um, and on the other hand, if we think about it, so directly it has, it, it can disrupt those neurotransmitters involved in sleep. But indirectly, if you think about it, Chuck, if you've had like a fat, you know, a high fat, heavy meal right before going to bed, you may have woken up in the middle of the night with a little bit of heartburn, right? And you're like, whoa, what did I just do to myself? And so indirectly eating those high fat foods, those heavy foods um, can cause heartburn and that can physically disrupt your sleep as well. All right. Last one I want to ask you about is protein. This is mm -hmm. another big one. You know, I, it goes one and two fiber followed by protein. What's the role in protein and sleep? So this, this data is a little bit mixed, I have to say. I was looking at, um, you, know, what are, you know, what exactly the role it plays. And what I found is that in some evidence, um, there's some evidence to show that high protein meals, whether it's plant or animal proteins, have been in, you know, shown to improve sleep. But in other um, studies and evidence that it's been associated with poor sleep. So the, the jury is still kind of out on that one. All right. And a lot of people love to have that late night snack or this gigantic meal at dinner. Does it really matter when we eat in terms of how well we're sleeping? Is the midnight snack not such a good idea? Right. So our circadian um, system or circadian rhythm is that internal clock that we have in our in our bodies. And what we know is we know that there are individuals who for work um, and can't help it have to work and have to eat at opposite times of uh, to the circadian clock. And what we found is that individuals, specifically shift workers, um, that there are higher rates of obesity in individuals who work that way. So trying as best you can not to eat um, after a certain time, seven, eight o'clock, um, and um, is gonna be beneficial for your sleep. And not just for your sleep, but it's gonna be beneficial for your waistline as well. Uh, well, let's talk about the waistline. I think that that's a perfect transition because I'm thinking back to when I was still more than 400 pounds. I'm thinking, man, you know, I was so tired all of the time. But when I would sleep, the quality just wasn't really there. I was always waking up. So if somebody is more overweight, are they more likely then to be struggling to get that good quality sleep that we need? Um, yes, most definitely. So we know that with elevated BMI, with elevated weight, there's actually a stepwise progression of this. There's an increased risk of something called obstructive sleep apnea. And what sleep apnea is, it's a, um, there's a couple different kinds, but the one that's more associated with obesity is obstructive sleep apnea. And what happens essentially is there's a physical collapsing that happens in your upper airways when you lay down. Um, there's obstruction in your tonsils, in your throat, uh, with your tongue, you know, falling back. Um, and all of the pressure that's within the abdomen gets pushed up against um, uh, your rib cage. And so all of that together actually disrupts sleep. So you stop breathing. So you have either hypoapnic, which is, you know, slow, slow, slowed breathing, 
or apneic episodes where you completely stop breathing. Um, and you're not aware of this. So individuals who have obstructive sleep apnea may not initially understand or know that they're, they're not breathing when they're sleeping. It's usually their partner that tells them the next morning, hey, listen, I think you were choking in your sleep or you stopped breathing. And that usually prompts um, a doctor's visit. Um, but what we know is that, so specifically when we look at numbers, so if a normal weight, it's more common in males, but with normal weight um, males, the incidence of obstructive sleep apnea is on average about 11%. For women, it's much lower, 3%. Now, if you go from normal weight to overweight, where your BMI is anywhere from 25 to 30%, that risk or that incidence increases from 11% to 21% in men and from 3% to 9% in women. If you're obese with a BMI of over 30, that percentage skyrockets to 63% in men and 22% in women. So what you eat matters. Those we know from the Adventist Health Study, those who eat a plant-based diet have the most optimal BMI. And so getting um, a diet or being on a diet that's rich in plant um, uh, foods that are rich in isoflavins, that are rich in tryptophans, that are rich in complex carbs, and also allow you to be in an optimal BMI, that's setting you up for really good sleep. All right. And let's end with this. I think that this is kind of an interesting question to ask. Is it kind of a vicious cycle where you eat these high fat, poor quality foods your sleep quality suffers, but because then you're sleep deprived, you then turn right back to those high fat, poor quality foods, and thus you kind of become trapped. That's exactly right. Um, we know that individuals who are sleep deprived, that their hormone levels of certain um, um, hunger hormones, so for example, leptin and ghrelin, which are important uh, regulators of appetite and hunger, um, are, are abnormal. So there's decreased leptin in individuals who are uh, sleep deprived and there's increased ghrelin. And that essentially translates into um, increased hunger and specifically hunger for calorically dense high fat foods. All right. Now let's transition here and play health boost or health bust, where we investigate a popular claim on the internet and try to separate fact from fiction. And this is the perfect, I guess, low fat plant-based frosting on top of the cake, because today's case is dreaming of making up sleep. A lot of us believe that it's okay if we're a little bit sleep deprived during the week because we can just make it up on the weekend, basically hibernate for 14 hours on Saturday on and on Sunday, and we can just catch up and, and fully recharge. But Dr. Sardana, is this actually true? Can you truly catch up on sleep? Um, really great question. I think that was a fallacy that I, I always thought that I could. You know, going through my college years, uh, you know, I was like, okay, fine, I'm just gonna put up, you know, pull all nighters and, and do what I need to. And then over the weekend, I'm just gonna sleep and it'll be fine. So, researchers actually studied this. Uh, they took a group of young adults and randomly assigned them to three different groups. So, there was a group that got nine hours of sleep, which is a great, a robust number of hours of sleep, a group that had five hours of sleep, so sleep restriction. But then there was also a third group that they randomized um, these young adults into that had five hours of sleep during the week. But during the weekend, they had two days to recover. So they let them sleep for as long as they wanted. But then following that, they had another uh, two days where they only slept for five hours. So what did they find? They found in those individuals in groups, um, in the second group and the third group, so the five hours and then the five hours that um, had that weekend recovery, um, for both of those groups, that insulin resistance was elevated. So why is that important? Because we know that insulin resistance plays such a big role in the development of diabetes. They've also, they also found that over the weekend that they eat more at night and that they gained weight. So there wasn't really that big of a difference between the individuals who had that sleep restriction versus those who had the opportunity to try and catch up on that sleep. So catching up on sleep is a myth. Um, please sleep, uh, get your rest where you can, you know, get it in wherever you can fit it in. Um, but it won't undo all of the, um, the potential damage that's happening over the week. My best advice would be to figure out ways during the week that you can get to bed a little bit earlier, limit the things that we talked about that may be interfering with your sleep that you may not be aware of, excuse me, and then maybe even consider taking a nap or two um, during the week as needed. There you go. The idea of catching up on sleep is a health 
bus. Dr. Jazz, thank you so much. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. I would like to welcome for that Dr. Barnard back to the show. And Dr. Barnard, today's question comes to us from Mac, who was watching our show earlier this week on gut microbiome. And he writes, is there a direct association between microbiome quality and the development of Alzheimer's disease? Good question. Uh, that is a good question. Actually, that has been the subject of quite a lot of research. I have to say, I don't personally think that we know the answer to it entirely, but I'll, but I'll tell you what researchers are thinking of. Um, there are many communications between the gut and the brain. They go in both directions. Um, the gut will, will make compounds that act like neurotransmitters and will actually uh, direct the brain in various ways. And so uh, researchers have been looking specifically at connections between gut bacteria populations and Alzheimer's disease. And what you are imagining is in fact true is, is that the gut populations will change based on what you're eating. Uh, so if you're eating an animal-based diet, uh, meat, dairy products, eggs, you get one kind of bacteria. If you eat a more plant-based diet, high in fiber, beans, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, you get other bacteria thriving in your digestive tract. It's the latter bacteria that seem to be better for the brain, those that are supported by a plant-based diet. But, but there's a big however here, Chuck, uh, and that is the very same diet that causes an unhealthy gut microbiome does other things that are completely unrelated to it. It's got saturated fat. Meat has saturated fat. That raises your cholesterol. That affects the brain adversely. And researchers back to 2003, I think it was, uh, started reporting that a high saturated fat diet alone was associated with about three times higher risk of Alzheimer's. So what does it mean? Yeah, I do think there are connections between the gut and the brain and Alzheimer's is, is di directly in the crosshairs of research. However, it's also true that the very same foods that cause an unhealthy gut microbiome do a lot of other harm in the body as well that in turn will lead to Alzheimer's. So uh, all of these things are making the case for really emphasizing the vegetables, the fruits, the whole grains, the beans, getting away from the meats, the dairy and the eggs. All right, Mac, hope that that satisfies your question, my friend. If we did not get to your question today, fear not, because there are plenty of other opportunities. We open up the mailbag every single day here on the show, and sometimes even once, twice a week, we do these big, long, extended Q&As where we just plow through a whole bunch of them. So go ahead, even though we already answered today's, keep posting yours in the comments section, and I promise you, we will do our best to circle back to them. You can also tweet to us, no problem there, if you're more of a Twitter person, at PC. CRM and at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just use the hashtag exam room podcast. And Dr. Barnard, before we go, uh, I got to ask, how are things going over at the Barnard Medical Center? You know, I was looking at research earlier this week that showed that uh, in particular, there were a couple of case studies with diabetics that showed that they were getting a lot of help through telemedicine right now during the pandemic. Right. Um, before the pandemic occurred, we had already launched our telemedicine program. And in addition that we have a specific program for people with diabetes to give them the, the self-management skills and education that they need. And I really hope people will take advantage of it. Um, the mindset sort of had been diabetes is a chronic disease. It takes a long time to get sick and it'll take you forever to get well. And we take a much more dynamic view of that, which is let's get better. Let's get well now, let's err to the extent that we can. So the, in other words, the blood sugars can come under control fast. Uh, very fast. Um, that's good because um, that's one of the underlying conditions. And if we can tackle that better, we're going to do well. So um, we're all telemedicine all the time right now during the pandemic and people, I hope, will get a hold of us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to see them, our, whether that's our doctors, the nurse practitioner, uh, our dietitians, they're all ready to give you a, give you a hand. And you see that number on the screen there, 202-527-7500, 202-527-7500, or just head over to barnardmedical.org. Available in a whole bunch of states, more being added all the time. So the current list is California, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Kentucky. If you live in any one of those locations, our doctors or our dietitians will be able to meet with you. So schedule your appointment today at barnardmedical.org. And don't forget, if you liked what you saw on the show today, thought that it was fascinating, the conversations with Dr. Barnard and Dr. Sardana, go ahead and subscribe to this very channel right here on YouTube and set an appointment on Facebook, noon Eastern, Monday through Friday for the exam room live. And 
What's more, we also have a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify and Stitcher. Dr. Barnard, we are really everywhere with this show. I mean, this show has grown so much. It's so much fun to do. Well, we uh, a lot of that really reflects on you, Chuck. I think you've done a great job in bringing this forward. Uh, that we, we didn't plan for this pandemic. But when it came in, I really appreciate you jumping in and having this, this daily briefing every single day. And I'm delighted to be doing it with you. It's my pleasure. And so all you need to do watching this now, head over to Apple Podcast and search for the Physicians Committees, the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and please leave a five-star rating. And when you do that, you help even more people discover this potentially life-saving information. So do that, subscribe, hit that five-star rating, and we would be ever so grateful because we truly are on a mission to make the world a healthier place. But it is Friday, and that is all the time that we have. So I hope that you have a phenomenal weekend, and we're going to be right back here on Monday for another episode of The Exam Room Live. Until then, for Drs. Barnard and Jasmine Sardana, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Have a great weekend, and until Monday, keep it plant-based. <laughs>